Good afternoon. I am Joe Weisbord, and I am absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to introduce the speaker for this edition of Fannie Mae in-house. Our speaker today, Rusty Smith, is Associate Professor of Architecture at Auburn University and Assistant Director of the world-famous Rural Studio of Hale County, Alabama, which you'll hear a lot more about in a moment. Um, I just wanted to share that after a half a dozen visits to Hale County, um, many hours spent driving the back roads with Rusty and Mackenzie and their colleagues, um, it's given me a really profound sense of the challenges facing rural America. Um, the despair of the hollowed out economy, the loss of local stores, the loss of public services, the deteriorating infrastructure, um, the brain drain. Um, but I've also seen a lot of hope and a lot of sense signs of opportunity. And one of those that's um, maybe made me more hopeful than, than a lot of things I've seen is the work of the Rural Studio, and especially of the young people, the young students that have committed themselves to building homes, to building fire stations, libraries, community centers, playgrounds, um, that have brought a real sense of tangible hope uh, to these communities that have been neglected in Alabama. Um, Rusty today is going to talk to us about Rural Studios' 15-year-long housing research project that began with the aspiration of creating a high-quality, high-performing, attractive home for the modest sum of $20,000. Iterating on designs over many years with hundreds of students and their fresh thinking, with dozens of the country's top architects, engineers, designers, building scientists, Rural Studio has brought the modest, site-built, balloon-framed home to unforeseen standards of energy performance, resistance to weather events, design, comfort, and economy. Um, this has been a humble reminder to me that solving the complex housing problems that we face today um, can't be done only sitting behind a desk. Rural Studio demonstrates how promising solutions emerge from people on the ground are working in communities and understand the real needs of the people that live there. So Rural Studio's systematic pursuit of the 20K house resonated with Fannie Mae's strategic priority on increasing affordable housing supply. And it has really been one of the career highlights for me to have the opportunity to work closely with Rusty McKenzie and their colleagues on this project. So let's watch a video clip to learn more. Why do we build 20K homes in Hale County? The 20K home is an annual project at Rural Studio. Its objective is to create a home that is affordable to all, a new typology that makes sense for Hale County and benefits the community. The price tag for which the 20K home is named is derived from the biggest mortgage someone receiving a median Social Security check can realistically pay. The goal is to build the home quickly, but well, in three to four weeks, producing an economic engine by which a builder and three local workers can profit. Its design is based on principles learned from the vernacular architecture of Alabama. Each year begins with a critique of the previous year's homes to understand which aspects did and did not work. Part design project, part research and development lab, the 20K home aims to provide beautiful, good quality, economically viable homes for all. A line of products that can be produced and ultimately distributed open source to local contractors to create affordable housing that works for Hale County and the southern region. Built in the community, by the community, for the community. Please join me in welcoming Rusty Smith. That was, that was pretty good. That was, uh, um, any questions? Um, thanks, thanks a lot for being here. It's really uh, um, 
the, the, the relationship that we've had with Fannie Mae over the last couple of years has been instrumental in, in getting this project off the ground. And, and hopefully, over the next uh, 25 or 30 minutes or so, we can talk a little bit about, about, about how that is and why that is and what we're doing together and, and sort of what the, what the future of that collaboration um, uh, has, has in store. So um, Rural Studio is, uh, um, uh, I always look at this first slide and I'm always, I kind of wonder how to talk about it. But I think probably the, the easiest way to talk about it is um, um, it's maybe what it's not. So the first thing it's not is it's, it's not a, an, an, uh, an architecture firm. Uh, it's not a construction firm. And it's not an architecture school. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of each of those things, but it's really, um, at, at its core, it's a, it's a piece of a piece of a piece of a thing. Uh, the, the big thing that it's a piece of is Auburn University. Auburn University is a reasonably sized land grant polytechnic, historically polytechnic institution. Uh, in Auburn, Alabama, we've got about 28,000 students that are enrolled there. Uh, about 4,000, 4,500 of those students are graduate students. So it's, a, it's it's predominantly an undergraduate um, uh, university. Uh, the university is broken into uh, 13 colleges, so those are some of the pieces of that big thing. One of those, uh, college, one of those 13 colleges is the College of Architecture, Design, and Construction. Uh, inside of that college, it's got a number of programs. It's got building science, it's got uh, industrial design, uh, graphic design, and it's also got the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape Architecture. In that School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape Architecture. There's another one of those pieces of the thing. Uh, there is the program of architecture. It is a, a five-year bachelor's undergraduate program of architecture. So all that means is that students come to the university primarily as, as undergraduate students uh, at 17, 18 years old, enroll as freshmen in the architecture program, study with us for five years, and at the end of five years, they graduate with an accredited degree in architecture. They can go out and practice architecture. Um, as as uh, part of that five years of study, they have an opportunity to leave campus from anywhere from one semester, 15 weeks, and move to Hale County in West Alabama uh, from somewhere to 15 weeks, one semester, to upwards of two years of, of that five years of education and work in Hale County in the community um, designing and building all kinds of community infrastructure there uh, in, in, this, in this area of need. Um, so it's in the business of architectural education of what we call a design-build program. So that means that the students both design and build all of the work that they're uh, 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 developing as part of their architectural studies. So I say that because it's, it's, it's intrinsically important to understand all of the work that I'm going to show you. It's not my work. It's not McKinsey's work. It's actually the work of students who are somewhere between uh, 18 and probably 22 years old. And that's, that's really important to us. The, the, the reason we run a program like, like Rural Studio, a design-build program, is, is pretty straightforward. There's a couple of really simple premises. The, the first is that the best way to learn how to do something is by actually doing it. Um, just makes sense. Uh, we all know that we go to university to be educated, where sort of our head gets filled up with knowledge, and then, at, then when we get out of university and we start to work, that it's through the activity of experience that that knowledge gets transferred into what we think is more important, which we just refer to as know-how. So that transference through experience from knowledge to know-how is really important in the, in the project. The other thing is we, we ask the students to take on really complex and complicated problems. Uh, not necessarily to always solve them, but to certainly think about them and to address them. And we found that if, if we're doing things that are really difficult and complex, we don't quite know how to, to do it, the best way to do those things, to, to think about these issues, is to do it together. And so the program is also extraordinarily collaborative. Right? Um, we are. There we go. So if you know if you know anything about Rural Studio and you're here to, to, to learn to hear a little bit of the work that we were doing relative to the housing uh, uh, design and development, rural housing design and development pro uh, program project. Uh, if you know anything about Rural Studio, you're gonna, probably going to know something about the houses. And this is just some of the early houses. The first house that the, the students designed and built at Rural Studio 25 years ago this year was the Haybell House for Shepherd and Alberta Bryant. Um, Butterfly House, uh, Harris House, that was, was an important house. So you've probably seen some of these uh, before. Um, 
Rural Studio is located in rural West Alabama. It's in this area that's, that's referred to as the Black Belt. And it's named the Black Belt for this sort of rich, loamy soil that's been deposited through millions of years of, of, of a very hydrologically dynamic place. We have, a, have four major rivers that move through this area and has deposited this soil that has made it historically an agricultural place. You, you know it historically for its agriculture. You know it also uh, historically for the place that it's held in the sort of civil rights movement. Many, many, many of the foot soldiers from the civil rights movement in the United States came uh, from this area. This belt that's, I'm going to move back here, this belt is called the Black Belt. It runs through this area, um, extends over into the, into the Mississippi Delta. Um, it's a place that's considered, uh, it's a federal designation, it's a place that's considered to be persistently impoverished. Uh, and, and, and all that means is that 30%, um, that, uh, uh, tw uh, sorry, 20% or more of a population of a given county has lived consistently and persistently in poverty for 30 years or more. There's about uh, 370, 380 of those counties in the United States. They, interestingly enough, run pretty consistently through this Black Belt area, over through the Delta of Mississippi, uh, across Louisiana, into the um, Colonias area of the Rio Grande Valley. Then they move up through Georgia and take a hard turn north up through Appalachia. So these, these places that are very different from each other, they're uh, different culturally, historically, ethnographically, geologically, they're all very different. But they do have one thing in common, and it's, there are these historic landscapes of extraction. There are places in this country that have had uh, decades and decades, centuries of resources taken predominantly out of the ground, no resources put back into these places. It's the thing that they share uh, in common. Um, these levels of poverty, uh, you know, sort of generally the poverty in the United States, there's about 13% of Americans that live in poverty. In Alabama, that rate is significantly higher, 17%. Hell County, I, I sort of talked about it, is, is this place of persistent poverty. It, it has about 24% of uh, poverty rates. That's a pretty typical percentage number for these persistently impoverished places. The part that gets hidden in some of those numbers, though, is when you look at these persistently impoverished counties, if you look at um, uh, childhood populations, elder populations, and populations of color, those numbers that get hidden, those population percentage that's living in poverty can jump up into the, the 50, 60, 70, even 80 percent range of those particular populations. It is a place of, of great wealth. There's a, a sort of continues to be a great a place of great financial wealth. It continues to be a place of great uh, of financial and historical wealth. Um, but it also is a place that still sort of uh, people live in absolute abject poverty. It's stunning how people live in America today in the 21st century. Um, we're very familiar with urban poverty. We, we, we see it every day. We sort of rub up against it every day. We're really unfamiliar with rural poverty. It's, it's hidden. Um, the truth about rural poverty today, though, is, is not nearly as many people still live in tar paper shacks like you saw uh, in the Harris house that I just showed you. This actually is where a preponderance of our population lives. It's in the second, third hand, 40, 50 year old uh, 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 trailer home. Uh, this is our competition for the 20K house project. And it doesn't look like much, but it's pretty stiff competition. We'll talk about why that is in, in a little bit. Um, if I can figure out which hand to hold this, there we go. Uh, so th this is this is sort of uh, uh, this is in Forkland, Alabama. Uh, this looks like a natural disaster, right? We're, we hear a lot about natural disasters. We were talking about it just before um, th this 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 got started. How important some of the thinking is that's going on at Fannie Mae around natural disaster. This isn't a natural disaster. This is just springtime in Forkland, Alabama. Right? This is how people live. Um, and I think there's something about, we, we think about disasters of these things that happen really fast, that happen really quickly, that we have to respond to really quickly. We have to think about this sort of substandard and housing availability crisis that we're in in this country as a disaster. It's going to take that kind of thinking to think about it. It's just happened in slow motion. It's happened over decades and decades and decades, but it doesn't keep it from being a disaster on epic proportion. 
This actually is a sort of a failure of, a, of, of um, many systems simultaneously, of infrastructure systems, of, of river transportation, of, of water supply, of electricity. These, these homes are all on septic systems. Where are their septic systems? Right? Three feet underwater. Right? These are the kind of issues that our, that our clients deal with. Um, this is what our students look like when they come to Auburn. They're perfectly normal uh, students like anywhere else. Um, they come, and, and one of the very first things that we engage with the students in is what we refer to as neck down work. I talked about that sort of transfer of knowledge to know how. So, moving that, that knowledge that you've built in your head into your body through work that you do with your body becomes important. Uh, in this case, the students were donated a, a couple of barns. Here, they're taking one of them down. You can see that they're sort of categorizing the material and thinking about the building. One of, this is an example of one of the best ways to learn how to put something together is to take something apart and put together pretty well. Um, this is a, the, the work is real work. It's real client-driven work uh, with real clients, with real budgets, with real sites, with, with real uh, sort of impacts and outcomes. Uh, from the students' work. In this case, the students are working with Rose Lee Turner. There's, you can see Rose Lee on the left. She was the client for the house. She had two adults. She was living in a home that was falling down around her. She had two adult sons that had been displaced from the home that couldn't live at home uh, anymore. And those kinship networks that our, that our uh, family, our, our neighbors and families and clients live in are extraordinarily important. Um, the students work with a lot of um, uh, consultants, you know, architects, engineers, and those sorts of things to begin to, to help the students understand how to make really good decisions about their buildings. And then the students ultimately, before they start building, they sort of know everything there is to know about their building, about how they put it together. And then they actually get, get building. And this, this is a pretty typical sort of project for us where the students, uh, this is Rosalie Turner's house here in the background, the little white building. And in this case, the students had the idea that they would keep Rosalie sheltered in place in the existing home, build a new home on a platform in front of that house, and then when they could move Rosalie into this first phase of the house, then they could tear her, tear the old house down and, and build a second wing on that would allow the, the sons to, to, to come back. So this is the house under construction. House uh, being uh, refitted. So here you see a lot of that wood from the barn being repurposed and reused uh, on the interior of the home. You see Allie using bricks that came from those barns alleys right there. I'm going to point you out. But you have to put way up in the air. Because you get applause if you do. Um, so here, here, you know, sort of working, using, reusing those materials inside the house. This is a photo of Rose Lee and her sons the day they moved in. And then uh, you'll also, you'll see uh, favorite Predominantly uh, in this project is a beautiful front porch. The uh, front porches are extraordinarily important rooms uh, in all of the buildings we, we design uh, and build, whether they're, they're houses or otherwise. This is the home as it's beginning to be finished. And so, as we said, as soon as Rosalie moved in, you can see the students then tore the little white house down and then added this wing onto the house here that allowed the two sons to move back in this is where the existing house was and allowed this sort of large uh, courtyard for the family to live in to, to be developed. Uh, so it's a really small house, but leveraging that L shape made for a, a sort of a large exterior space for the students to live in. So we don't just, the students don't just design and build houses. I mentioned that we do all, oh, they design and develop all kinds of community infrastructures. In this case, is Antioch Baptist Church. The students have, have designed park pavilions, footbridges in parks. This group of four students working with the Audubon Society designed and built a 100-foot tall birding tower on uh, the series of seven Oxbow Lakes on the Cahaba River. We do a lot of work like this where we take a, um, a burned out school building and reappoint it as a resource learning center. I'm going to get control of this thing in a minute. Reappoint it as a resource learning center. Uh, projects like this for Greensboro Hospital, where this was the courtyard that was in the hospital. So imagine this is the place where patients and doctors and nurses recreate and rehabilitate. Imagine it uh, you know, uh, in West Alabama when it's about a million degrees and about a billion percent humidity. Uh, the students designed and built this space in the courtyard. Uh, 
I afraid to push that button. There. Uh, we do, the students will design and build larger projects like this. This is a, a fire station for New Bern, Alabama. I'm not sure. Fire station for New Bern, Alabama. There you can see the fire station on the right. It became a really important civic building. So this was designed and built by four students. It became a really important civic building, an important meeting place for the community. And then after that uh, building was built, another group of four students um, designed and built a town hall, which became a really important building in the community because this gave, they gave the community a consecrated place to vote in the community. And we talked about civil rights and voting rights is extraordinarily important in this place. If you have to drive to vote, you probably don't. And so being able to walk in the community to have a place to vote is really important. The students will uh, do a lot of projects like this, where they'll have a material like these barrels that were donated to them um, uh, and, and sort of do what architecture students do. They organize them, they build walls, they think about making rooms, and then ultimately this group, this, these three students took on the design and construction, learned how to weld, and took on the design and construction of a playground for Greensboro, Alabama. So it's very beautiful, artful, an extraordinarily fun place to play for the kids in the community. And sort of power of unintended consequences is kind of a, a, a nice musical instrument as well. Um, uh, this group of four students uh, were tasked with um, designing and building a boys and girls club for Greensboro, Alabama, one of the largest projects. That's Allie again. You don't get applause this time. So it's Allie as a, as a, a sort of a, a, a grown-up student uh, when she came back out to the Rural Studio and her team. Uh, standing here about a year into the project, they've, they're present, they've just presented, you know, they're very formally, they're dressed up in their nice clothes, they've presented to their client uh, exactly how they're, they're going to frame uh, the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, I, I love, have you ever seen this photo, Allie? Do you have this? It's my favorite because it's... Um, if you look at how they all are, exactly how you guys all are, it's the same exact photo, <laughs> exact photo, a year later where they're a little smelly or a little grubby or a little more worn out, but they're under construction. And now you can actually see uh, they're sort of you know, in their large scale framing model now uh, at, at full size in Greensboro. This is the Boys and Girls Club today that they designed and built. You can see it has, has this sort of large uh, porch on it. We talked about the importance of the porch. And it obviously becomes a really important after-school um, uh, program uh, uh, location for the community. Projects like this, Newburn Library, uh, that both brings a, a, a learning resource to the community as well as high-speed internet uh, to a community that otherwise um, wouldn't have it, right? All of these projects become really important, right? They're really, really important. But you're here to talk about housing, right? And I've spent half of our time talking about community projects, right? Well, why is that? Why do, why do we do that? Why is that important? Well, it's probably through the fire station is the best way to talk about that. Um, if you don't have a fire station, what happens? Yeah, you're vulnerable. Your houses burn down, right? And if your houses burn down at an inordinate rate, what does that mean? Well, it means you, you can't get insurance, right? And if you can't get homeowner's insurance, what does that mean? It means you can't get a mortgage, right? And if you can't get a mortgage, well, what does that mean? Well, you're pushed right into chattel property, right, into personal property. And so all of the work that we did around housing affordability would, would do nothing without a fire station, right? So beginning to understand the larger system that these issues exist within becomes extraordinarily important. Um, so... I include this slide because it includes every lie you've ever heard about the, the project all in one place. So first it says we have a house that costs $20,000, and we don't. Um, then it says, and this was in uh, 19, this is August uh, 2009, so almost 10 years ago. It says eight years after Mockbee, uh, Samuel Mockbee was our founder. Eight years after Mockbee, the legendary design build program, that's, so we're not that legendary, but the legendary design build program figures out affordable housing 10 years ago. You guys didn't hear about it. Where were you? Um, 
we haven't figured it out, right? Uh, it's really complex. It's really complicated. But the, pro the, the premise behind the project is the same today as it was 15 years ago when we started. It's a research project to design beautiful, uh, uh, dignified, high-performance homes uh, that can support an industry of home building uh, across the rural South. We want people to be able to live within their, their means, to own their own home. Um, and we want that project to be scalable, that we can actually, it doesn't rely on rural studio, that we can actually scale that project out into the larger world uh, to people who need it. Across the history of the project, 15 years, we, we've designed and built over 40 projects in our own service area. We've got over 22, 23 different prototypes, depending on how you count them. And some of the things that we've learned around this sort of housing affordability project is that um, you know, at, at the very basic level, no matter what you're doing, you have to design houses that are durable, buildable, weatherproof, and secure, right? That's the kind of the floor that you stand on. If you're not doing that, I don't know what you're doing, but you're not dealing with housing affordability, right? That's the floor. There's also these sort of aspirational goals uh, behind designing these houses, is that they have to have a sense of presence. They have to foster, design to be, uh, foster a sense of community. They have to engender a sort of health and wellness within the occupants that live there. They have to provide long-term accommodation for sheltering in place, aging in place. They have to be well-crafted, even though they're sort of intended to be designed and built with locally uh, procured materials, local labor, local craftsmanship. They have to be well-crafted. Um, so today, what we've done, Rural Studio has always worked in kind of a charity model, where we've designed and built homes and given them to our clients of, of need in Hale County. Today, what we're doing with Fannie Mae, uh, in collaboration with Fannie Mae, is working to develop a system of procurement that can take those research products that we've developed in the classroom and move them out into the larger service area. We have what you'll see when you, when you go outside and downstairs, you'll see actually we have four product line homes that we're sort of moving out into the world through uh, housing providers. We've got Dave's house, MacArthur's house, Joanne's house, and Buster's house, so they're all one and two bedroom homes named after the, the client that originally lived in the very first prototype that was developed. Um, working with Fannie Mae, we've worked to make sure that those homes meet all of the kind of uh, uh, lending and insurance requirements that, would, that they would need to meet to, to be buildable through a, a, a broad service area. We've developed uh, construction, uh, very comprehensive construction documents for all of those homes. We've worked with external contractors to begin to build and validate those homes against those uh, construction criteria. One, these are examples of that. Um, one of the things that we learned through this project is it's not enough just to show how a contractor how to build something, but it's important to show, um, uh, or some, it's not good enough to show what to build, but we have to, have to show them how to build it and more importantly, why it's built that way. So we have, uh, again, um, working with Fannie Mae, we've uh, taken the IKEA model, where we all know we get those, those uh, instructions and that pile of material and that goofy little tool, and suddenly all of us become really competent furniture builders, right? Uh, we've taken that sort of idea. We know everything there is about the house and how to build it. We know everything about the process. And we've developed a, sort of an instruction manual that, that a, a builder or a housing provider can actually follow sort of step by step through this process. Again, not just uh, what to build, but how to build it and why, why it's built that way. And this becomes really important. This is sort of the next sort of frontier that we're working on with Fannie Mae, is to begin to think about how uh, homeowners, you know, why homeowners actually lose their homes. And this is gonna sound like a funny, funny thing, but our homeowners, our clients, don't lose their houses because they can't afford their mortgage. Our homeowners don't lose their houses because they can't afford their mortgages. I'll say it twice because it's so funny. What actually happens is one of four things. They have an unexpected maintenance or repair bill on their home. They have, uh, we live right in the sort of the catcher's mitt of, uh, of, of, of the Gulf Coast, so we catch all of the hurricanes that come up into the right where they turn into tropical storms is on top of Hill County. We live in um, Tornado Alley. Um, so that sort of weather-related damage has a significant impact on our homeowners. Our homeowners will have an unexpected energy bill. Uh, we live in a place that can have a $35 to $50 energy bill in March or April. It can have a $250 or $300 energy bill in July or August. And you as the homeowner didn't do anything different. 
house was the same temperature, same comfort level, but all of a sudden your energy expense has skyrocketed. Have an unexpected health care event in your life, or you might have a disruption in income. And those are sort of complicated or complex in our, particularly in our service area, because we have uh, uh, sort of uh, homeowners that work part-time work, shift work, seasonal work. They often live in these sort of complex kinship networks where they shift in multi-generational families where they share everything from transportation, food, income, child care, elder care, you name it, they share it. So any disruption in that system can have dramatic negative impacts on a family. So beginning to think about how the procurement system of the home can address those four issues of energy performance, resiliency, long-term health and wellness outcomes, and begin to think about how can it affect uh, income relative to job creation. If we can begin to address those things, we can get way further down the pipe relative to addressing housing affordability. And that's really where the design problem for us is today. This, this aspirational cost of the house of $20,000 is really important to us. What the house costs is really important. But this is where the real design problem occurs, is in that what we refer to as the monthly burn. Um, that if we begin to think about how we can move, not just save a client money, save a homeowner money, how we can actually help them take expenses and turn them into investments. Right? We think about the home as an investable asset. Owning a home and investing in a home is, is the cornerstone of financial wealth building. Um, that's our sort of belief. If we can begin to think about this differently, then we might be off to the races. So if we can save a client, and I'll use this example, if we can save a homeowner $25, uh, $25 a month in energy costs, that's, that sounds like a nice thing, but it actually isn't a lot. It doesn't really move the needle for our client. But if we think about this process a little differently, if we, we know in a conventional mortgage is if we just take $1 of energy expense and move it to our mortgage, $1 a month, we can actually finance $200 of additional construction. So now if we take that $25 in energy savings, which isn't a lot, and we take it instead of just putting it in our pocket, if we actually move it from a cost to an investment in our, in our home, we've just bought $5,000 of additional construction at no additional monthly cost to the homeowner. Right? So if we can save $25 a month in energy, and it costs us less than 5000 it's a win, right? So this isn't a conceptual project. This is a, this is a sort of a real, a real project that we're working on with, uh, with the help of Fannie Mae. This is, a, this is a project under construction. This is it on opening day when you sort of turn the keys over to the homeowner. This is the home. About six months later, we've had the homeowner living room. Actually, almost, almost nine months now. This home was built um, to, to passive house standard, which is the highest energy performance standard you can build a home to today. It's also built to fortified gold standard, which is the highest resiliency standard you can build a home to today. And this is, sort of, and this is, this is a version of Bus, a high performance version of Buster's home. And this is sort of how it works. If we built Buster's home to code, to current code, this is how the financing model would work. This is in conjunction with Habitat. This is their financing model. The homeowner qualified for a mortgage of about $250. The house would have cost about $50,000 to build. Utilities would run about $150 a month. Insurance was about $60 for a total monthly expense of $460. So this is, this is what happened. The house costs more, so we took the mortgage that was affordable to the homeowner. This is what she qualified for and ballooned it up to $371. Didn't qualify for this. It's made this house unaffordable. But if you look at what happened to the rest of the numbers, Right, this total cost of homeownership. If you begin to look, she's actually saving $168 a year across the cost of the home. So which home is more affordable? The home that costs more or the home that costs less? Right? That begins to be the question. And working together with partners like Fannie Mae, like Wells Fargo, like USDA and others, we're able to sort of tackle this problem systemically, look at all the pieces simultaneously, and how they're, how they're connected together. That's what you guys are helping us do. Um, and we continue to work on this project. Uh, I'm going to share one last thing, I'm, I'm, I'm at time. 
um, that we don't often share, and this is this is uh, uh, we don't often share this publicly, but um, we've had a lot of conversations with Fannie Mae about um, why you come to work every day, like what gets you to work every day, and this is what gets you to work every day. It's what gets us to work every day. It's not the houses, right? The houses sort of are this thing that sits between us and the people. This is uh, um, our first client, Shepard and Alberta Bryant. Um, from 25 years ago, some of our early clients, the Harrises, Rose Lee Turner, who we talked about, Michelle, Johnny May, Re. Buster. This is why you come to work every day. The pride of home ownership, owning your own home, what it does for our clients and our neighbors is invaluable, no matter what it costs. And we really certainly appreciate all of your help uh, in, in, in making these folks' lives a little better. So thank you. So, John, John Lawless is going to come up and ask some hard questions. I hope so. What's going on, man? I'm doing well. How are you? Thanks for being here. Yeah, uh, you thanks for it. tearing me up before I got up on stage <laughs> here. That was really, really nice well, message. This, well, th this is really going to tear you up. Buster just passed away oh. a couple of years ago. But um, uh, we would, the, light, the, the, the last part of his life uh, to live um, with dignity in, in his home. Uh, it, it, it's remarkable, and, and that's um, uh, it's, it's sort of a little bit of a tribute to him. To him, to him. It's amazing. So he's a remarkable human being. <clears throat> well, thanks for your partnership. Thanks for the work you guys do. I mean, you're tackling some of the most challenging problems we see in housing today, which is housing supply, particularly in rural areas of America. And so, uh, it's really incredible. So, thank you for all of that. You're welcome. Um, so, I will spend the next couple minutes asking you a couple of questions, and we'll turn it over to the audience to ask that questions. That <laughs> So you have a desk or something. Yeah. Your okay, so um, so the first question, which I think, um, you know, a, a lot of times when I've seen you do this presentation, is always sort of in my mind, which is scalability, right? So yeah. um, I remember first coming to Fannie Mae, I had to learn to count my zeros. This is the nature of the business. We yeah. There's so many zeros, right? And so, but how do you think about um, expanding beyond the footprint you have? What are some of the obstacles in terms of taking that IKEA model and seeing it realized in a lot of places? Well, the, yeah, that's a great question. The biggest, it's a hard question. The biggest, the, the biggest obstacle, and all of the obstacles are tied up into this one, uh, particularly because we're focused on, in, on, on rural issues, um, although a lot of our partners are interested in the product in more urban areas. Um, the fundamental problem with addressing any of these issues in rural places is that rural America is really, really big. Um, it's about 90 3% of our land mass uh, of the United States. If you just look at just rural areas, about 60 million people live there. So it's really big, really spread out. And so that, that challenge of, of addressing it is, 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 is enormous. There's also issues of um, sort of what's universal and what's particular. So things like financial models uh, and insurance models can be relatively universal. They can work in a variety of places. Uh, housing pr procurement in this country, um, no matter you know sort of how technologically advanced or not it is, addresses some of the same issues of, that are that are extraordinarily local. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, land is local, <laughs> yeah. labor is local, materials uh, by and large are local, and so beginning to think about how you address um, something nationally with a products that require so much local investment and knowledge and know-how and work in such a big, diffuse place is really challenging. Not to mention, I assume regulations and sort of permitting processes and things like that are, yeah. are different everywhere you go Yeah, well. exactly. It's sort of, you know, what happens at the federal level versus mm -hmm. what happens at the local level. Um, but there's a, but you know, you have to know that there's a tremendous amount of goodwill around the project and, and the socialization that Fannie Mae's allowed to kind of get the word out and to allow, you know, a state you know, the president of the state uh, 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 code officials association to say, 
hey, we've heard this is a problem with getting, you know, working with local code officials. We'd love to work with you at the state level to get the word out to, so that we, because we can begin to solve that problem at a more local level by helping you get that word to our, our you know, sort of local code officials. That's great, that's great. So um, the other thing you touched on, which I think is amazing, is energy efficiency and the role that can play in housing. Um, I heard recently that the number two cause of homelessness in this country is actually inability to pay utilities yeah. behind domestic abuse. So it's, yeah. it's incredibly powerful how thinking about the other costs of homeownership can be really beneficial. So, how, so kind of a two-part question. One is, how do you make people more aware of that when they're thinking about buying or building a home? And how do you make consumers <laughs> appreciate that difference? Yeah. Um, but also, I'm just kind of curious, how does that change? Is the $20,000 house change in cost to, as you think about some of these upgrades? So, yeah, so. it does. I mean, beginning to, I mean, certainly the cost changes. I mean, just, you know, just that, that, that $20,000 number, if we can address that. Um, you know, we built the first house uh, um, 15 years ago. We, we met that number. That house had $12,500 of, of total material mm. in the home. Uh, still has a homeowner living in it today. Um, that same house today, 15 years later, just the f timber, the, the framing package in the, in the house is over $20,000 in material. So just those sort of shifts, you know, this, yeah. just, just thinking about what a house costs to build is a dead end street. And not a dead end street, but it's, it's that, it, it poses that challenge, right? Because that number is always, the answer is always going to be, it depends, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when you're trying to answer that question. Beginning to look, beginning to think about home ownership the way, not just our clients think about it, but so many people think about it. Nobody knows what their house costs, but they know what they spend on it every month. That's how we think about it. Um, and, and so beginning to, to work within that paradigm of what are the monthly costs and how those things can be linked together uh, in ways that if you squeeze one, you can, you can sort of expand another um, in, in a way that actually wins for everybody. Because certainly getting a house that performs better for the homeowner is really important. But guess what? If we, if we take a house and we make it cost $5,000 more dollars, at no cost to the homeowner, in that example, um, that makes the home more valuable, one, because it just costs more, but two, because it performs better. Mm -hmm. Now, that becomes really important to the lender, right? Because, because that's what you secure your, your uh, loan on the house is, is the value of the house. It secures the lender in that way. It also secures the lender because it better prepares the homeowner to pay the bills on time, right? which addresses the first part of your question, right? You smooth out those fluctuations. The, 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 that Habitat house that I showed you, that house is actually, um, we just installed a, a, a PV array, a photovoltaic array. That house is now actually making that client money um, in, a, in, a, in a house that's clearly affordable. She's pushing energy back to the, to the energy company there um, at no additional cost to her. The bank can't know that historically, right? but now we can because we can model these things. We model the performance of the home up front. We, have, we test the homes in every phase of construction to make sure that it meets or exceeds the parameters of the, of, in this case, the energy performance model so that we know what that house is going to cost or in this case earn before the homeowner ever moves in. And so suddenly, in this case, because Habitat was fully in, engaged in the financials, they could they were fully in charge of the financial model, they could understand that. We want to move that model out into the larger world, which is a, a paradigm shift in how we think about how a client uh, is managing that. Th that's amazing. And, and you know, for us, as we look at sort of lower income folks when they buy homes, they're buying the older, less efficient that's homes. Right. And I was fascinated. I was traveling to Richmond and I was trying to figure out if I were to buy a 2,500 square foot home here, how would my utility bills look like? It's almost impossible to find that information. Right. So as you're sort of sharing this and doing the work you're doing, I think it's going to have a major impact on the market. Please join me in thanking Rusty, who's just uh, <laughs> incredible, amazing. Thank you so much. Wonderful.